Welcome back to Crosstalks. For those of you joining us for the very first time, Crosstalks is a collaboration between Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. We've just had an exciting panel discussion about the importance of leaving the office and doing research out in the field. If you missed out, just look under previous talks on this website. Also, a quick reminder, you have a unique opportunity to ask questions directly of our studio guests towards the end of the show, simply by calling us on Skype, where our name is Crosstalks TV, and that is also our name on Twitter. Mankind has explored quite close to every corner of the Earth, but only above sea level. Under the surface lies a great deal of unknown territory, not only in the geographical sense, but also in terms of biology and physics. The oceans are also an underutilized resource that we could use to create new types of food, materials and energy. Today we'll dive into a few different ways in which scientists today are exploring the oceans. And joining us here in the studio are Jakob Kuttenköhler, uh, Professor in Naval Architecture at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Nina Kirschner, uh, Senior Lecturer in Numerical Ice Sheet Modeling, Stockholm University, and Fredrik Gröndal, Associate Professor of Industrial Ecology at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Let's welcome them with a big hand. <laughs> so all of you on the panel have very different fields of research, but one thing you have in common is the exploration mm -hmm. in some sense of the oceans. And we're going to talk about some different approaches to that tonight, but I think we're going to have to start uh, with the elephant in the room, or so <laughs> to speak, or the what on earth, Jacob, what have you brought for us? I brought Carl. Carl, and Carl is an, I'm, I have to cheat, aut autonomous underwater vehicle, an yes. AUV. Uh, can you explain what this is and what it's used for? Yes, Carl is uh, built here at KTH, and he is built for uh, our research in trying to expand the methodologies, refine the methodologies for such vehicles to, to be used later on as tools for oceanographic research. So CARL is an experimental platform. Uh, CARL weighs about 13 kilograms. He can stay underwater for um, about uh, 24 hours. He is not a torpedo. It looks like a <laughs> torpedo. Yeah, it looks. And some people call it torpedo. It's not the torpedo. He's very friendly. Uh, he is also quite slow. Typically, he goes at, at uh, two to four knots underwater. Mm -hmm. And he can travel about 30 kilometers. And he has, uh, he's made of aluminum and uh, uh, composite material, the, the pressure hull. He has a GPS in the nose. Mm -hmm. He has a satellite modem so that we can talk to him. He has Wi-Fi also, actually. <laughs> so when we are close to him, we can talk to him. But yeah. It sounds like a person, yeah. but I guess, <laughs> <laughs> I guess what we're talking about here is in some kind of a ro robot. I'm, I'm trying yes. to translate this yes. to words that I can understand. Yes. You said an experimental platform. It's a kind of robot. It's a robot. He's a drone. Yeah. What does and, he do? And we try to teach him to be autonomous. Yeah. And there, therein lies the challenge, because we want him to, to uh, perform missions mm -hmm. without the interaction of us. I mean, we programming, program him to do stuff. But once he dives, basically we lose contact with him. I mean, being underwater is not, is not a game. It's, it's in many ways harder. The environment is, is tougher and rougher than outer space. I mean, you we may have, have said this, but I may have missed it, or I'm just going to have to ask again, sorry, because it's too, so much information. Uh, what does he actually do? Does he would sample? I mean, he swims, obviously, but what, what, does he do, what does he do for you when he's in the water? Well, for, for me, I, we, we here at KTH <laughs> so far... Does he measure something? Yes, of course. <laughs> Information, yeah? Uh, okay. But as he lies here right now, he doesn't have too many sensors on him, on him. But once we use him for measurements, we strap on different kinds of sensors. Could be, I mean, we have oceanographers here, and, and, and uh, they are quite easy to please. I mean, just to mention temperatures <laughs> sometimes can be... <laughs> can make them happy. They yeah, have yeah. to bring them happiness. Uh, yeah. but, but he can measure, you know, uh, salinity, temperatures, um, pressures, of course, and, and uh, we can strap cameras on him. And 
So he has a kind of... Dr- it, no, I said he as well. It. Yeah. it <laughs> Carl is a kind of drone... He doesn't take offence. <laughs> ...is a kind of drone that, that brings measuring sensors of different kinds to the places where you yes. need them to be. Yes. Uh, and that can also be, be moving. Yes. Okay, that's very exciting. And I'm, I'm in the business of, of developing methodologies for the, for the platform. Yeah as the, the sensor-carrying platform. Nina, you're actively involved in research project in the remote and often uh, inaccessible polar oceans. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Uh, yes, I can. Um, Jakob is using coral in, I guess, waters that are rather close by or maybe in a swimming pool if it's a developing platform where you test things. Uh, for me, the unexplored oceans are always the polar oceans. I uh, like the ice. and. In the polar oceans, the ocean is actually coming in, ton- in contact with the big ice sheets. And that is a very important region for global climate. Mm-hmm. And I also do numerical modeling, and all the climate models that we have right now, they make predictions for future climate change, if you wish, but they need to be validated by data. And we don't have that much data, especially not from the polar regions. The Arctic is, for instance, the region on Earth with it, which is changing most rapidly Um, in response to global warming, but we have very, very sparse data from the Arctic. And the same situation is when you go to the Antarctic, and I have brought a slide for Mm. those uh, who are not so familiar with the Antarctic, because the Antarctic is a continent that is covered by ice. Uh, You see it's almost, it's entirely ice covered, Mm -hmm. and the ice is so thick that it floats towards the, the ocean, and then when it becomes a float, you see these bright white areas, and these, it's, these are areas that we call uh, ice shelves, and they are a float on the ocean, and the one that is down there, that mm-hmm. is the size of France, just to give <laughs> you an impression of, of the size. Mm-hmm. And then you can divide Antarctica in the East Antarctic part and in the West Antarctic part, and there has long times been a discussion about whether, especially the Western part, is unstable, and unstable that would mean that all the ice could, in the worst case, melt. And that would contribute to five meters of sea level rise. And these ice shelves that we have there, they, they play a very important role for the stability of this West Antarctic ice sheet. And if we now look under this ice shelf, and this is on the next picture, um, if we have that. Let's see if we have the next picture. Uh, do we have the next picture? Yes. yes. Well, this is one of the... Cov- and we take the next one. Directly. Even Even one more. There's one more. Here is a side view where you see these ice shafts stretching out and especially important in this stability question whether or not a large part of Antarctica would disintegrate and contribute to sea level rise. A large part uh, in this uh, discussion is played by this grounding line area down there and from there we need measurements and these measurements we only can get if we send Carl or a big brother of Carl because the distance is quite long. We would deploy our AUV in front there of the ice shelf and then would have hundreds of kilometers to go to make measurements in this cavity and to come down to this grounding line which is so important for the stability of of Antarctica. So we could use these things but just a little bit bigger. Okay, and let's see if I have parsed this correctly, uh, and also what you're not saying. So, so he isn't on autonomous quite yet, and to go the kind, and y- it's difficult to talk to him once he's in the water. So, to go that far under the ice to look for the kinds of things we need for this desperately vital information, it would be useful if it wasn't a truly entirely autonomous system, so to speak. Uh, he is autonomous, mm? okay, but he is rather small, okay. and, and Nina is, is uh, uh, her distance. He can go. He can travel for 30 kilometers. Nina yeah. wants to go 300 kilometers. Yeah. So oh, we need a bigger yeah, yeah, vehicle yeah. for the reason uh, of bringing more energy. We're going to need a bigger boat. A yeah. bigger boat. <laughs> a bigger. We need batteries yes. enough yeah. to travel. Nina needs batteries enough to travel 300 kilometers back and forth. Yes, and then for batteries that big, suddenly you need a, a larger, a larger drone one. And uh, yes. so I, I start, I'm starting yes. to see. Also, I thought this was a bit of a theoretical problem un- until you said five meters of sea level rise, because that is terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You it's, know. it's not going to happen, but we have to understand. For now. We have to understand these mechanisms, because on a small scale, these processes happen already now. We have regions where this grounding line is moving back and forth, and we lose ice in Antarctica, <laughs> but we have to understand the, the, the processes that are going on, I mean, to understand how the climate system on this planet works. Cool. We're going to move uh, to Frederick. We're going to come back to all of this, of course. Frederick, you're heading the, pro- the project Sea Farm, uh, where you are experimenting with growing algae uh, in the sea and, and ref- refining these into different products. 
Could you tell us a little bit about this project? Yes, I could do. We are trying to do something in Swedish, Scandinavian waters that have been done in Asian waters for thousands of years. We are starting sea farms to cultivate algae and we are focusing on a type of brown algae that commonly is called kelp and in this case it's the species we're working with now is called sugar kelp. It's closely related to a kelp species that you have in Asian countries. Is and it the kind that we would eat? Yes, you yes. could eat yep. it and it's also the most common species that you culture in waters, the one in, in Japan and in Chinese water. But we have a s closely related species here in Sweden. And the sea farm project is a quite big project that have five focus areas. And the first focus areas now is to develop methods in order to cultivate Swedish kelp. And the project, the first sea farm is located in the Koster archipelago on the Atlantic coast of Sweden, close to Norway. And there, this is the real critical thing, because we want to produce biomass, because algae biomass could be, be used for many, many nice things. So the next part in, in this focus areas we're working with is to take care of the biomass, uh, preserve it, handle it in the right way, and then we send the biomass to something we call biorefineries. These biorefineries are now located at Chalmers Technical University and at here at Polymer Chemistry here at, at KTH. And there we will use this lovely algae to get these really nice things because from algae you could get feed or chemicals that could be used for food, in food. You could have it for feed, for, for, for animals and so on. You could also have mat chemicals for materials that you could take make plastics and things based on algae, and you could produce energy. And with the kelp you could produce ethanol, you could produce biogas, for example. If you use small tiny algae, you could also make biodiesel. And then we have, <laughs> and that is the third focus area. And when we are done with all this, we will have a rest product, and that will be the thing we will use and produce biogas. And then we could also come get some fertilizers maybe out of this. And then eventually there will be a leakage out in the sea. But since we have the cultures in the sea, the culture will also take up nutrients that is leaking out. So in this ca case, we are closing the loop, you could say. So it's uh, both uh, climate neutral, it doesn't release any carbon dioxide, and it also doesn't need any feeding or anything. It's just feeding on what is in. So in Nina's work, we can say, is, is, is measuring uh, the, the climate for, for, among many other things, the climate change uh, that we're already causing. Your work, we can say, is, is part of the transition into a, a more resilient and sustainable society uh, where yeah. our previous mistakes won't kill us, uh, to be brief. I'm, I'm quite I'm mind blown. I mean, I'm, I know you can do many things with, with algae, but this is, so you're saying fuel, uh, materials, feed for animals, uh, additional fuel, and it's carbon neutral. Yeah, and you're, still, you're using, everybody here is eating algae every day. You just look, have to look and see on this E on your ingredients in the food. 410, 415, 416, most of these things are algae products that have a high value. And the thing is that we are thinking about sustainability the whole time here. And in order to get this going in an in a economical way, we need to increase the, the on this value chain from mm -hmm. a culture to the end product. We want to extract as much values in each step. And this will also be an environmental problem, uh, 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 environmental solution since we have the cultures in the This sea. is incredibly exciting. Are you quite, I mean, I realize, of course, that we're quite early on in the process. Yeah. And, and one of the things I'm hearing that you would need quite vast sea farms mm. to produce the kind of volume that we would need to, no. for instance, fuel for Sweden or whatever you, the goal is? No, the thing is that in, in Asia they have huge farms and mm. they produce mainly the algae culture them for food, but we want to have more high value products out of it. And we believe that even if we don't, we would all want to have sea farms all over the coastline. So we want to produce as valuable products as possible. And then we could charge quite a lot for, for the product, and that means that we could have 
relatively small farms and still get profit out of it. That I is our belief. I will anyway. ask you the question that no scientist wants to hear. When? When? <laughs> when? Well, <laughs> I, I could say we already have a sea farm in the sea, but that's for an uh, experimental sea farm. But now we have money to extend it to a two hectare. So we are trying to do this scale up quite quickly because in order to evaluate this, we need to have big scale uh, directly. Just out of curiosity, could you use an AUV like, like this one in, in your work somehow? Yes, we were talking about that in, in the break there because this would be excellent because a farm, a sea farm needs to be surveyed. You say we, we have to monitor it, we have to go out and see if, some, if after a storm or something, is, uh, control it. We, we have to measure <laughs> things there because under the farm it might fall down material. And this material might deplete the oxygen under the farm. So maybe uh, a, a robot like this could measure oxygen and we could monitor things happening. And another thing that is interesting with the sea farms will be that they will work as artificial reefs mm -hmm. and attract fish and things like that. And this could also be surveyed with this type of, of um, vehicles. And, uh, it's, it's, I, I could see a number of uses, and we are working close to the coast, and we don't need to have this long range. That, I, this that is wonderful. I'm, I'm excited that you're all finding use for each other's research, but did you truly just meet here? I mean, do, do all the ocean disciplines collaborate all the time, or, <laughs> or could you collaborate more? We actually met <laughs> here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I think there's some kind of lesson here, but yeah. I mean I think yeah. I, that's very very uh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe something incredibly fruitful will yeah. will come out of uh, come out of this. Yeah. Let's add another person to the mix. Uh, speaking of underwater vehicles and exploring the oceans, <laughs> joining us now on Skype is Ron Allum, world-renowned engineer, uh, specializing in underwater vehicles for traveling down to the deepest places on Earth. Welcome to Crosstalks, Ron Allum. Hello, how are you doing? Hi. <laughs> Ron was responsible for designing the submersible that took director James Cameron to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth. This record-breaking uh, expedition also resulted in the film Deep Sea Challenge 3D, currently in theaters in many parts of the world. Ron, what were the most interesting aspects of this project to you personally? Uh, well, being asked to build a submersible with um, no submersible background, um, you know, it was a very rewarding experience. Um, you know, I had gained a, a great rapport with uh, James Cameron, working on a number of uh, films, including um, Ghosts of the Abyss, an IMAX uh, presentation, um, Aliens of the Deep. Um, so through a number of years, you know, working with James Cameron, um, and seeing how I operate with uh, submersibles. Um, it was actually James Cameron that decided that he wanted a different type of submersible and therefore didn't go to a conventional submersible manufacturer. Um, so we got talking on, on board um, you know, the, the ships we've been on and this is, was you know, the idea of a, a deep ocean going uh, submersible to you know, film the, the deep oceans and you know, bring back science to um, you know, the scientists. You know, it has been a, a mission of uh, James Cameron for some time. And yeah, I was very fortunate at the end of one of the expeditions, uh, he asked me to um, you know, look at the feasibility and it just went from there, one step at a time. So. That's exciting. What, what would you say was the biggest challenge that you had to face or overcome uh, during this project? What's the biggest technical challenge with, with the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Yeah, look, uh, yeah, pressure is everything at that sort of uh, depth. Even a solid piece of metal compresses to some extent. Um, our biggest challenge, well, we made our, um, our dive sphere for the... Uh, uh, yeah, for the pilot, it, you know, we made it out of steel, so it was quite heavy, and we had to float it. And one of the biggest challenges was to make a flotation material that we could use as a chassis of the vehicle. Um, you know, if we used a metal chassis, we would then have to float it as well as a, the pressure hull. Huh. So it was James Cameron's idea that, um, you know, if you could make the the chassis out of a flotation material, then we would save a lot of weight. 
and one of our, one of our objectives is to make this vehicle less than 10 tonnes so we could put it on any ship of opportunity and dive it anywhere in the world. Um, we went to, um, it ended up being 12 tonnes and the pilot space is a little bit bigger and more comfortable than um, you know, we anticipated initially. It was going to be a, a very cramped, confined space. Um, but, you know, it was a um, very comfortable sub to, uh, to pilot and uh, it was very effective. You were also responsible for piloting the craft. Can you tell us a little bit about what that felt like? Yeah, look, I, I've piloted a couple of uh, submersibles. Uh, certainly, you know, Deep Sea Challenger was the deepest. Um, yeah, it, it's, um, you've got to remember, you know, you, we're, we're doing an expedition with James Cameron. It's all about uh, bringing back the images. So we had a, um, uh, on the left-hand boom, we had a, a pan and tilt with a spotlight. On the right-hand boom on the submersible, we had a, a pan and tilt with a camera. We had to control those uh, two devices. We had to drive the submersible with another joystick. Um, when we would land, we would have this manipulator that we could reach out onto the seafloor and grab samples and rocks. And, yeah, that required another manipulator. So, yeah, we had all these controls. And when you're flying the sub, pointing a camera, pointing a light, trying to keep the camera in focus, trying to bring back good images, um, it was very, you know, task loaded. And, you know, at the same time, it was one of the most, you know, sensational moments, you know, of my life. It was absolutely fantastic. Isn't it also terrifying? Uh, I don't think you've got time to be terrified. <laughs> and you know, the fact that, you know, I was so deeply involved in the engineering of it. Um, you know, we did a lot of uh, computer analysis, um, you know, programs to look at the, you know, the metal uh, pressure hull. Um, we resolved issues with um, the acrylic or the plastic port that we were looking uh, through or a camera we was looking through and we were looking at images of a camera. Um, so we had, and everything on, on the vehicle, um, you know, it was pressure tested prior to it going on the vehicle. Yeah. We couldn't pressure test the whole vehicle because there isn't a pressure vessel worldwide that can do it. Um, you know, so we, we tested every component that went on it. So, yeah, we had a lot of confidence that, um, you know, the, the sub would survive pressure and, most importantly, come back to the surface. And luckily it did. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, thank you, by the way, thank you, Ron, for being uh, on Crosstalks and also, of course, for staying up so late. I realise it's 2 a.m. where you are. Uh, it's, it's, this is so interesting. Uh, I'm going to go back to the studio now, but do, do stick around for the rest of the show uh, if you can. How about you, the studio panel? Do you have any immediate reflections on, on hearing about this expedition? Uh, Jacob? Yeah, um, I'm impressed. I must congratulate you to, to what you succeeded with. And I think it was a good choice to, to bring the engineer, the chief designer, on board. <laughs> sort of like, I mean, if, if you went with him, um, it was surely safe enough. For, for what period of time were you, were you down there? Yeah. Oh, look, I, no, the dive that I did was eight hours, and it was to a depth of 1,100 metres. Um, the idea of my dive was to pick up on images for the film and at the same time James Cameron was piloting an ROV which is a remotely operated vehicle that um, you know, descends using a, a cable and that had a, a 2,000 metre ca um, a capability um, and that was being piloted by James Cameron on the surface and we had also uh, placed our 3D cameras on that ROV to, to get some of those images in the film. So, yeah, it was, um, I guess, you know, I was part, a critical part of it. Um, you know, my background is in, in broadcasting. So, yeah, I, I knew what shots we needed, um, how, what was required to make the film. And, you know, it was very closely uh, associated with the 
design and the build of that that vehicle that um, you know I, I knew how to operate it and I knew everything about it. So it was absolutely a fantastic you know experience. That helps. Well, now to everyone, you are working on very diverse aspects uh, of the unexplored oceans. Uh, what is it that you have in common? Uh, where could you combine forces to reach uh, reach new fr frontiers? What do you say, Nina? Well, I mean, in, in principle, we all have the same interest. We want to explore the oceans. We have different focus on it. You have a focus on farming, if I may say so. And then there is this technology development. And I look more on uh, acquiring or learning more about fundamental process of the climate. And we have discussed it earlier a bit. It's, it's no longer about that we have to learn so much from each other. I mean, there's no point in that I learn to construct how this works or that I learn how to do the farming. is, but. The point is really that we should get together and, and, and combine what we know in order to bring some added value to it and then bring the science that we do to a new level. I think this is what, what we should do and, and what we have in common is that we are fascinated by these topics as different as they are. But there is this desire that we solve these problems that we have and that we seek answers for. There's a, I mean, now if, if we're looking increasingly, uh, and, and certainly with the threats to the global food production systems being, being what they are, we are looking to the, to the sea uh, to be used in, in many more uh, ways. And one challenge there would seem to be that, that such large parts of the ocean floor are unmapped mm -hmm. uh, and unknown, um, not only the polar yeah. regions, but, yeah. but uh, even close to our yes. own coasts. Yeah. Uh, do you have any reflections now we should start addressing yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been, uh, last summer I've been uh, doing some surveys uh, on the Norwegian coast in Svalbard and we had the, the most up-to-date maps actually and according to the map we were the, with the boat on a glacier. So you see how much areas are unmapped even close to the, mm. to the coast actually. Mm. But these are big, big projects, these mapping projects and I don't think we will ever manage to, man to map all of the ocean. They're simply too big. And then we have to decide, and this is a decision not only for the scientific community, but also for society, what is the priority? For which purpose do we want to map? Do we want to map because we have a military interest, or do we have an economic interest, or a political interest? So this is a consensus that we have to, uh, to find altogether. What do we want to map, and for which purpose, for instance? Mm. Jacob, could, couldn't we send out a lot of robots to map for us? Yeah, we, we I mean, <laughs> we could... <laughs> Cloning Carl. We, can, we can use <laughs> robots. We can use drones. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're, they're the, the entire solution, but but it is. I, I want to emphasize that you know, for recreational boaters, yachters in here, only five percent of Swedish shallow waters, more shallow than than ten meters deep, only five percent is 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 well mapped. <laughs> so so we are we are actually involved in in projects of, of mapping shallow waters. It would seem that this would be something that we would need to crowdsource. We would need to get a lot of people mapping waters somehow. Certainly yes, people yeah. could, could get into this. That's a business yes. opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a very interesting. Did, did you, did you, Frederick, did you want to come in? No, I just said that, I mean, another very important thing is to uh, more understand how the, the oceans work and the ecosystem, because we have a very fragmented knowledge about, about the sea. And what is happening now when we want to produce more and utilize the sea in a more sustainable way, start farming, aquaculture, and, and develop that in, in Western countries, you could say, more. Then, uh, in the same time, we maybe are ruining this production system by, by climate change and things like mm. that. So it's uh, ocean acidification is a big thing. So, I mean, we, we, we need to understand the ocean and, and the production shares because something is happening now very fast with, with yeah. the environment, the ocean. Uh, we know from the problem of overfishing that humans haven't always stewarded the resources of the oceans wisely. And this program, pro problem is aggravated by conflicting interests of nation states and, and so on. If from your different uh, scientific perspectives, how should we start to think about about oceanic resources and the, and the control of them. Will there be another space race into the sea? In, well, a, in a way, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not raised, but, but uh, robots like this is definitely a part of the future. And we have seen you know, um, drones on, on land and in air being used for, for different purposes. 
uh, just looking back a few years, that was almost uh, science fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nowadays, they use regularly. And I was at a concert the other day, and, and there were you know, several uh, uh, quadcopters in the air mm -hmm. filming. So, and, and so the technology is becoming more, more available for, for a lot less cost than, than a few years ago. Uh, cost is going down, robustness is going up, and uh, availability is increasing. So uh, there is sort of a race going on, yes. Nina? It's not only a scientific race. Um, I mean, I've been to the Arctic a few times, and in the Arctic this is already going on because there's this land grab going on. There's these many resources in the Arctic, and as the ice, the sea ice disappears, all these new routes open mm. up, and all those countries which, mm. uh, which border the Arctic, that is the US and Russia and Canada and Norway, and Denmark through Greenland, they claim large areas of the Arctic. And this, is, this has big political dimensions and economic, of course. Mm. So it's not only a, a purely scientific race that is going on there. Yeah, and I think we, I mean, but you just look on the U European Union research funding taking place now, it's for growth, economical growth. And they say that this should take place in the ocean because there is a big potential for, for economical growth. I mean, we are utilizing maybe 1% of the production capacity of the ocean and on land we are using 40% for human beings. So want we, we want to produce more food and for people and so we, we need to go into the ocean because there is the potential and uh, also for energy and for, for a lot of other things, transportation and, and things like that. So, and they are putting now, I think for t until 2020, it's more than 700 billion crowns. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, Jacob, <coughs> at the beginning that um, that the the oceanic environment is is even more unhospitable in some ways than than space, and I, I think th there is something I'm realizing as we're talking about this that I've I'm, I'm, I've never thought very much about the ocean. It's just yeah. water that's between <laughs> places <laughs> yeah. to most of us, yeah. I think, and this idea that there are these vast mm. unexplored mm. Uh, territories. There's something, I, I mean, I, I realize it's also the kind of work that Ron is doing is, is participating in changing this story that these are places now where you can go and, and look and bring back stories mm -hmm. as, as, as well as, as knowledge mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. Do you think, sort of. yes, Ron? Oh, so I was just going to say that, um, look, uh, Deep Sea Challenger was a, a proof of concept vehicle that we can get into and, and look at the, the deep oceans and there's an area the size of uh, North America that is totally you know, unexplored. You know, it's below a depth of 6,000 metres. Um, you know, for a long time, scientists always thought that, um, you know, well, I didn't think that exploration was possible below 6,000 metres. Um, so it lay dormant for, for quite some time. But, um, you know, now, you know, there's this huge continent down there that's totally unexplored um you know and you don't just just don't know what's down there until you you go and have a look so you know it's most important nina i just wanted to say a thank you to ron because you mentioned when you were talking earlier you said you didn't have time to be terrified and uh, i just wanted to to say thank you for that because we i mean in sweden there is uh, there is a growing awareness of the importance of this research into the oceans uh, we just got a, a big amount of money funded to buy a, a big version of carl and my nightmare is that when we navigate it under the ice that we don't get it back and so i will try to keep what you try to keep in mind what you said i will try to work so much with that that i don't have time to be terrified but this navigation under the ice is so complicated that we need really we need help of people who are specialists in developing the technologies for that not to, as we say in Sweden, paint a devil on the wall, but let's paint the devil on the wall. It is, it is a, pro a problem that, that exists, that, that um, scientists, I don't know how to phrase this delicately, lose equipment in the sea. Yeah. It's a thing, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 yes. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You, you're, you're, Johanna, you're pretty spoiled. When you, when you want yeah. to know where you are, you bring out your phone and you get a GPS yeah. fix mm. yeah. in a second. Yeah. Uh, as soon as we dive deeper than this, we don't have access to GPS. 
So just knowing where you are under the mm. shelf ice, that's pain in it's the neck. A it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> and, and if you go for 300 kilometers and you're only, let's say that you're only about one degree wrong in, mm. in, uh, in yeah. course, you end up five kilometers from where you think you are. And the emergency routines for these things are that they go up, but there's the ice. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to think about rescue missions that these guys do by themselves. Uh, yeah. Which is giving us nightmares. I'm understanding <laughs> that a really long cable is usually not going to be an answer either. No. no. Can we, are these solvable problems? I mean, will we ever be able to solve them or do we just need to build more robust um, ah, but th th therein lies the, therein, therein lies part of the, the challenge. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm in this. Because we need to train these to be more autonomous, to be more capable of, of, uh, of treating situations that are unexpected. Uh, I mean, just mm -hmm. the, the Carl actually almost disappeared once. He, he, he <laughs> went into reverse and dug himself into sand on the bottom. <laughs> And that, of course, that scenario, we didn't think about that. So he wasn't prepared for that. So he didn't know what to do, poor chap. <laughs> I'm, but, I'm realizing but, now why it's this signal color. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so we, we need, to, we need to, uh, to, to train and, and we need to be interdisciplinary here and, and, and collaborate with other robotics people and, and the, the end users of the equipment to, to, to train these, equip them for... for all sorts of, of, of unexpected situations. I have to let the audience in with their questions in a few moments, but I do have uh, one, let's do one more round. If we look forward into the future, let's say 25 years, which mm. if I do my math is correct is 2039, that means that the kids who are starting school this month will probably be doing their postdoc work then. What will they be working on? In, in your respective fields, where will we be 25 years from now? What will be happening? Uh, I realize the answer won't be entirely scientific because it will be in the realm of guessing. But, you know, what's, what would be your best guess, Frederick? Well, I, I think we will have, hopefully, work utilizing the sea in a much better way than we have done in the past. And that mm. we don't forget that sustainability is an issue here. Are we now going to exploit the seas in a more commercial way in, in this sense? We, we need to do it in a sustainable way. We have to take care of it. And I think from my project's perspective, I think we will have in 25 years, there will be sea farms in Sweden and there will be biorefineries utilizing uh, interesting substances from algae biomass. And I also think that we will have uh, wind parks out at sea and also I think wave energy will be more developed and we will have parks on, on wave energy parks, and that will also be built right now in Sweden, on the, on the Swedish west coast. And then there will be huge possibilities for mm. uh, vehicles like Carl that will run around there. And also I'm, I'm realizing a lot of work opportunities for human divers as well. Yeah, Nina. Bringing them up <laughs> in the shallow waters. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nina, what's, what's happening in your field 25 years from now? Well, it's difficult to give answers to that, I mean, because we are driven by questions. But I think, I mean, if we, if we can use more of those calls in, in all the areas, we will learn a lot more about how the processes in the ocean work. I mean, mm. right now I'm mostly looking at the sort of at the boundaries of the ocean. I look where the ocean meets the ice sheets and I look at the seafloor because I work a lot with marine geologists. Mm. Uh, but understanding everything that is between the water, everything that takes place in the water, the life and, and the, all these things that grow and how the carbon is, mm. is, is circulated through the ocean and back to the atmosphere, I think we will learn a lot about that. Mm -hmm. in the next 25 years, and it's important that we do. Definitely. Jakob? In 25 years from now, we'll be, we'll be working together in... No, we will be retired. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we get to retire so young, you know, 25 years from now, so but I think we're going to be working into our 90s. But yeah. we're, 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 look, we're longing for better batteries. Better batteries, yes, please. Yeah. But yes, everybody please. needs we better batteries. I mean, yeah, everywhere yeah, in exactly. society, we need better batteries. So that's going to be solved, don't that, you think? That's going to be solved. I'm looking to you in the audience. Yeah, You will solve it, yes? And these, uh, these uh, robots will act in, in cooperation with each other. We will have clusters of, of, of things like this 
solving different kinds of problems for, for, for uh, end users like, like we've heard here, but they will collaborate a lot. And if someone gets dug down in, in sand, he, will, he or she will, will call a friend and, and which will communicate back to land and so on. They will be smart systems. I just realized that uh, the plural for fish, uh, for like a group of fish, is a school of fish. So it's yeah. kind of they're, they're schooling each other as well. Yes. That's nice. Uh, very briefly, Ron, 25 years from now, uh, what, will, what will the submersible business look like? Um, look, uh, I really think that, um, you know, Jacob's got it with, um, uh, you know, the, the vehicles like Carl. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, the, the humans have, uh, I don't know, look, it, it, there is this um, requirement for exploration and for the need for people to go and, you know, go and see and, and go and look. And, it's such a, a different experience rather than sitting on a ship in front of a screen, mm-hmm. um, you know, say driving an ROV. Um, but deploying a an AUV where you set it out on a mission and then, you know, when it comes back, you've got all this data. So, you know, we've got to be able to utilise all, all the data that's been collected and, and use it to... Um, you know, for, you know, what Jacob and, and Nina are saying is, you know, s- uh, sustainability, mm-hmm. um, you know, we've got to control exploitation of our um, resources that are underwater. And generally, you know, we've just got to learn more and, um, you know, look after, you know, what we have, you know, in our oceans. That's right. I think we have a, a question on Skype. Do, do we? Uh, let's see. Can we get the question on? Hello. Are you all looking at me now? Hello, Hi. Chris Fisher from Utah. Uh, yes, welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm an explorer on the ocean. I've led 20 expeditions since 07, um, capturing and tracking these large apex predators for our scientists, and, and some of which you over there in Europe know about Lydia, who swam across the Atlantic Ocean. She's a great white shark, and we open source our data. So. I think one of the things is someone who's come in to try to find a different way to fund expeditions and accelerate the rate of learning. You know, I'm interested in the thoughts of, of different models for funding. It seems like the institutional and government money is gone, and we've tried to create a model of making exploration worth it for companies by creating great inclusion and scale around it, and as a demonstration of brand, great brands doing great things for the future mm-hmm. of the planet. And, and I, ha, you know, I would be interested in understanding, you know, in 25 years, I think we'll be crowdfunding the Fortune 500 to clean up the marine debris in the Pacific gyre with technology and capacity that doesn't exist today. But I think one thing um, that's shifted a lot is the capacity and institutional capacity and government capacity to fund. Yeah. And I'm so- interested in... Um, You know, we're trying to create alternate models of funding to accelerate learning and then also the disruption of the institutional model of the ownership of data. That's very interesting. And sharing it with the world to create a more uh, resource-focused approach rather than an institutional or individual focus. I would be interested in the panel's thoughts on on those types of issues. Thank you, Chris. So do you have uh, any immediate uh, responses to recap? So the question is funding models uh, uh, and then also what happens to to the knowledge, essentially. Uh, Is it... Is it feasible to think of of uh, of knowledge being? Uh, I mean, I, I realize in the ac- academia, ideally, we always uh, open source uh, our data. However, when we are are doing our research in private partnerships, that doesn't always happen. But then again, the new funding models, on the other hand, oh, quite often do require uh, private uh, collaboration. So there's also a sort of conflict of interest, I guess, between these between these two questions. But do you have any reflections on on funding or? or the ownership of data. Nina? I would say I'm, I'm actually supporting the idea of sharing the data rather unconstrainedly whenever possible, because the, the, the chance that somebody else out there is doing exactly what you plan to do with the same data is very, very small. Mm-hmm. Usually you benefit if two people from very different angles look at the same data and do their thing, you will not get out, uh, you will not get out two, two identical things of that. You will get two different things that complement each other. And uh, therefore, I think that sharing the data as soon as it's allowed or possible, whatever is in your contract or regulations, 
I am always uh, supporting the, the idea to share the data as soon as possible. Jakob. And especially when, I agree with, with Nina, and especially when people from different fields meet. So I'm, I'm grateful for Crosstalks for, for letting us meet here. Yeah. That's very cool. Fredrik, do you have ideas about funding? How, how, how that well, would work? Well, the only thing I believe is that we, we have to join forces and, and, and have, I mean, there is so many, we need so many knowledges from so many part, different disciplines in order to get this going. So we need to cooperate more and, and be open to each other instead of being competitors. Yeah. And that I think is a good. Thank you, Chris, for being on Crosstalks. Do we have a question from the room? I'm looking at the clock again and realizing we're running out of time. Yes, uh, please go to the podium, state your name and academic affiliation, please. Yes, uh, my name is Eric Samuelson. I'm a chemistry student here at KTH. And I'm a bit curious about the uh, kelp farms, uh, how much you're trying to integrate it with the ecosystem and uh, what kelp you're using and uh, what changes you're making to it. OK, that's a good question. I mean, we Let's are, do a relatively brief answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we are utilizing uh, a species that we already have, wild in Swedish water. So that it's a common species. It's the most, one of the most common kelp species we have. Mm -hmm. And it's a cold water species that is adapted for Swedish water. So we are not using any gene manipulated species or anything like that. So we are just, instead of going down, dragging them from the cliffs and disturbing the ecosystem, we have the cultures hanging in the free water. And that is the, the only way we could be allowed. We cannot pick them wild because they are also important for the ecosystem. Okay. Yep. I don't know if it, this is, it does that answer your question. Yes, I was wondering if you were gonna like plant a lot uh, like a farm and then see if you could integrate it with the fish and everything else. Yeah, I mean that, uh, that will be because when when you hang things in the open water, it, they will be we are call, calling them artificial reefs, mm. and they will attract all kinds of adders, fish and things. So it will be a richer ecosystem, actually, with these hanging gardens, you could say. And it will not be a problem for profits? No, it won't be a problem, okay. hopefully. We Thank will. you. Do we have another question from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I'm Ilva Sjöberg from Stockholm University. Uh, I was wondering about Carl and his cousins. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, what actually happens with the data from Carl? I can understand it must be very, very hard to analyze the kind of data you get from something swimming around at wild, pretty much in the ocean in 3D. Uh, where, how far is the science with actually analyzing what you get from such data? Good question. Yeah, Nina. Um, I mean, we haven't we haven't done that ourselves yet, but there have been these these AUVs have been beneath ice shelves, for instance. They have done it at the British Antarctic Survey. They have equipped it with what we call multi-beam echo sounders. It's basically a modern version of the old traditional echo sounder. You get beautiful pictures of the seafloor. You can even mount a sensor that is an upward-looking echo sounder. You can look at the underside of an ice shelf or at the underside of sea ice. You can measure from there how thick the sea ice is. You can calibrate it against the measurements that you get from space. So the data that you get is really, really good. It's much better than the data that we get when we sit on an icebreaker and do the same thing, because then we have all this noise of the ice breaking and everything. This guy can swim very undisturbed down there and make his measurements uh, in, in quiet and peace, so to speak. So the data is much more uh, less noisy, so to speak. So the data is very good, what I've seen. Is there a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hearing a sort of implicit question, which is uh, that I think maybe you said before that you should, re that all the data should be released as much as possible. possible. Do you think there is still space to do more things with the data that are not currently being done? Well, yes, definitely, because you have to put it together. First of all, we, we collect so much data that it is almost impossible to analyze it yourself or even with your group of specialists or whoever has collected it. It's huge amounts of data. You need many, many people analyzing it. And in the second you share it and you have different people looking at it, you get new ideas and get new inspiration and have new ideas what you can do with it. I'm also thinking about the mapping thing that we were talking about uh, about before, that, that when, where, where mapping is happening sort of indirectly uh, in the service of some other kind of research, yeah. one would want that data to, mm. 
be yes. collated somehow yes. centrally and not necessarily yes. on a proprietary platform, which no. I shall not name no. uh, in this context. Yeah, Jacob, would you like to add to that? Oh, Frederick. Yeah. Well, uh, I was just, uh, concerning data, I mean, there is uh, sometimes you see that you, we collect a lot of data, but we don't and then go out and take a lot of samples and collect data, but we don't have the after work because th that is the more uh, boring part of it maybe, that you evaluate the data mm. and, and, and that happens. I mean, we have a huge amount of data mm. that have not been evaluated, mm. at least in mm. Sweden. Thank you for your question. Mm. What I'm hearing here uh, is that there is enough work for everybody. Uh, almost yes. no matter <laughs> what field you're in, this yeah. is an area that you can no pun intended, really get into. It's maybe not the final frontier, it's certainly the next frontier. Mm. And that is all we had time for this evening. Please give a big thank you to our guests tonight, Jakob Kotenköller, uh, Nina Kirchner, Fredrik Gröndal and Ron Allen. Do join us on October 16th when we will be back with a new show taking a closer look at the smallest building blocks of life. You don't want to miss that one. Until then, be safe and be brave.